This, this is, is TLV1. The Tel Aviv Review. Hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review. I'm your host, Gilad Halpen. And I'm your co-host, Estalia Shenlin. If you like us, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter by going to our homepage. That's tlv1.fm slash review. Scroll down to the bottom and click the big red button that says Patreon. We're counting on you. Every week, Dalia and I bring you interviews with authors uh, of books and research and other things that we find interesting. This episode is produced in partnership with the Israel office of the Conrad Adenauer Foundation. It's part of a series examining, among other topics, uh, democratic erosion and authoritarian trends around the world, as well as the history and memory of the Holocaust. And the book we'll be discussing today touches on all of these themes. So we're very pleased to welcome our guest, Dr. Nitzan Shoshan. He is a professor at the Center of Sociological Studies at El Colegio de Mexico in Mexico City. He received his PhD in cultural anthropology from the University of Chicago, where he is taught as a collegiate assistant professor and Harper Fellow. His research has focused on nationalism and the far right in Germany and in Europe and other interests. And we'll be discussing his book, The Management of Hate, Nation, Affect and the Governance of Right-Wing Extremism in Germany, published by Princeton University Press in 2016. Dr. Nitzan Shoshan, welcome to the show. Thank you. Your book is a study of people on the margins. It's ethnographic research of outcasts, almost misfits, troubled people in society. And I want you to describe the phenomenon of far-right extremism in Germany today. Is it a phenomenon relegated to the margins and the kind of people that you spent time with? Or would you call it something that is growing and penetrating the mainstream uh, in German politics and society today? That's, that's a great question. I think one of the places to start with and one of the questions I pose in the book is what do we mean by right-wing extremism? Um, and so uh, and partly, partly the answer depends on whom you ask. Uh, in general, though, there seems to be broad agreement that there are worrying developments on the far right in Germany. How would you, how would you define those developments? To what extent do you want to see in these developments um, new forms that place um, the liberal democratic constitutional order in Germany in danger uh, is already a question of analysis and interpretation. Uh, but certainly the field has seemed to be uh, growing in recent years um, worryingly. I, I'd like you to uh, uh, refer to one of the quotes that caught my eye. Uh, with relation to extremism. And you're right, and this is a quote, the concept of right-wing extremism remains at once radically excluded and ineradicably constitutive of German nationalism today. Uh, can you please explain what you mean by that? Um, this is really at the, this stands really at the heart of, the, of one of the important or central arguments that I try to develop in the book. The idea is that uh, right-wing extremism represents certain historical forms in Germany, which have been um, projected outside of the nation. That is, they're imagined to stand uh, outside the frontier that divides legitimate and illegitimate politics. What legitimately belongs to the liberal democratic German nation today and what doesn't. And yet, at the same time, and that's uh, what I try to show at very different sites, from the Constitution um, to court cases, police practices, um, social work, etc., um, that original exclusion, uh, which in Germany is often referred to as denazification, um, marks the core of the liberal democratic German order. It stays there in the form of bans, prohibitions, um, various agencies and organizations, etc., that participate in, um, in constantly drawing that distinction, the distinction between mainstream and extreme that defines who, who's inside and who's outside. And so it's, it's at once outside and inside. 
Well, I'm this is really, to... I think, one of the uh, uh, you know major themes of your book is it's in your title, the management. I mean, so much of your research looks at how Germany tries to contain these forces, and I think that's a really interesting part of what makes Germany different in some ways from other countries because there are uh, you know extensive and elaborate measures to try to contain this. Can you explain whether you think these forces of right-wing ideology uh, are kept in check primarily by state, con- you know, sort of forms of control, or do the changes run much deeper, starting with the root causes of who Germany is and its identity, and that helps keep the phenomenon on the margins? Which is more prominent in managing hate? Mm-hmm. If I understand the question correctly, um, it uh, the the really the the um, interest in is in uh, whether the state and its policies uh, of managing this threat or other currents coming from society from without the state uh, are the central factors in these changes is that sort of where yeah that's what I'm interested in I mean I'm sure it's a combination of both but I'd be curious right. about what you think is the deeper cause uh, of why this this phenomenon is for the moment, somewhat on the margins. That's another argument to be had. To what extent it's still on the margins? And some would say mm-hmm. that it's very much in the mainstream today, or much more so. Um, I would say that, as you suggested, it's both and that they're inseparable. So a lot of the um, what we might think of as civil society that works in Germany against racism and to promote democratic values, to promote tolerance, to promote diversity and so on, or to uh, commemorate the German past, to educate about it, etc. cetera. Um, these are often initiatives that either are directly funded by the state um, in the framework of certain governmental programs that are designed Um, to push forward certain um, objectives, political objectives, uh, or political education, and so on. Um, And even if they're not, they're often members, they often participate, collaborate in very broad coalitions that come to life as part of government initiatives and policies. So so there's no clear separation, uh, I think, for example, between church organizations that help refugees, um, or NGOs um, that do advocacy and anti-racism work in Germany or education work at schools. Uh, and I think that uh, it, in some extent, it's both of these things. It's uh, in Germany, uh, the result of a, a generational story that has to do with the first, second and, and third generations after the war or in the sorts of uh, revisions and uh, revisits that they have taken upon themselves to do in their family biographies, in German history, in German politics, and so on. Um, and these changes um, are usually traced back to the late 60s and uh, early to mid 70s as an, as an important period of rethinking German past and German nationhood. But the debates, as I show in my book, have continued throughout um, the, dec- the, the uh, subsequent decades as well. Nitin, there's so much, uh, so, so much energy and resources invested in the management uh, of hate, both from, as you say, in the state and uh, outside the state. And on top of that, it is Germany after all. It is, you know, a bustling democracy where uh, many constitutional rights are guaranteed to the people, including the freedom of expression, the freedom of association, etc. It's also one of the wealthiest countries in the world and a, and, and, and a generous welfare state in itself. And, and as you state in the book, many of your of the subject of your uh, of your inquiry live off state allowances. Uh, and which brings me to think, you know, that the um, flip side of this management is perhaps that right-wing extremism in Germany could be seen as a form of privilege. What do you think? I have to think about that. There's certainly... Uh, Especially in a, relation certain... to other, other, uh, other countries elsewhere. I mean, in Eastern Europe, mm-hmm. like more hardcore Eastern European countries. You mean, you mean, uh, in so far as the threat that it poses to the re- to the to society seems more minor. 
that in, in a way cool. that you know those people can allow themselves to associate with right wing right. extremism despite everything that it entails in the German psyche, right? But still, at the end of the day, right. when it comes to the material conditions, it is a privilege. Right. Uh, I think there are two ways in which I can understand the question. So that one would be that the right wing extremists in Germany are in a privileged position because they're in, they um, enjoy sort of the benefits of a wealthy welfare state where liberties are guaranteed. The other is that, and that's sometimes remarked upon, that German society is privileged because it, compared to many other um, European countries today, still doesn't face uh, a threat as significant, at least parliament, in, in parliament, Mm. from um, extreme right movements. No, so Yeah, I that's a good question. Really, I, 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 first, I meant the first one, yeah, right. but, but also the, the second one, one is interesting yes. to comment upon. All right. So both of them are, are positive. So as far as the first one, to some extent, for sure, to some extent, um, these people enjoy certain rights, certain benefits. Um, there are, I think, two main points to be made about that. The first one is that those uh, benefits of living in a wealthy welfare state have been slowly eroding in Germany, regardless of the economic comeback that it, it's performed in the past decade or so. Um, inequality is growing badly, or paid job, minimum wage job and part-time jobs are growing steadily, and that's uh, those are the processes that have been going on for decades. So Often low unemployment figures hide the fact that for many people, the level uh, uh, of living hasn't significantly increased, um, and certainly for the lower classes. Um, and so that's one, uh, one point to be made about it. So for example, for the people I served, and that was still in the grip of a long economic recession in Germany, just towards its end, uh, at the beginning of the 2000s, uh, the people I worked with um, certainly had uh, welfare support for um, an apart apartment house, that is housing and basic necessities, which maybe people in the U.S. and, and other countries don't enjoy or not as much, but they uh, were also poor in relative terms. There was no way that they could dream of affording to get a driving license or to go on trips um, and uh, they live off of a relatively meager state um, payouts. Um, so that's one thing, they, which just goes to explain that they definitely don't see themselves and perceive themselves as privileged, but rather as the losers of recent processes in Germany. The other point I wanted to make is that they, might, they don't see themselves as privileged with regard to freedoms and liberties, because they definitely don't feel that they live in a country that guarantees freedom of assembly, freedom of expression, and so on, because of the serious, serious limits that the German state imposes on their activities. How does that affect your inquiry as an ethnographer? Because on the one hand, you know, as you say, they see themselves in a certain way. But if you look at it in a broader perspective, perhaps objective, uh, you'd probably object to that uh, term, their, um, their status, their, um, their position is quite... Uh, different. Um, how, how does that come into play when in 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 the ethnographic inquiry itself? Hmm. In many ways, uh, one aspect is simply the sense of paranoia that exists among some of the people that I studied, because they feel like they have lots of enemies and that many state agencies and state actors are out to get them. This is not entirely uh, a mistaken feeling. <laughs> And so issues of access, which are particularly important for ethnographic research, more than other uh, research methods, uh, become challenging. And that's partly responsible for why there's a, a dearth of studies, of ethnographic studies of such populations. I want to go back to one of the points that you're making about the people who have been left out of uh, you know, economic development. I, I was interested in how you situate this with other far right movements within Europe. And what you one of the things you claim that they share in common is the disappearance of some sort of romanticized vision of society, either a socialist ideal or a capitalist ideal. And what I what I'm wondering is if all of these uh, societies undergoing some sort of major shift 
creates a situation where people will fall through the cracks and be left out. And I and what that led to, led me to wonder is, are these extreme right wing movements at present often about a place where the have nots and the left outs find a home? Is that something that they share in common? I think that uh, they share it in common uh, quite uh, broadly across the world. But one has to keep in mind that they share it in common at a rhetorical level. That is, it doesn't necessarily always correspond to what one sees when one tries to measure um, sociologically the place that they occupy in societies. So right-wing revivals across the world today vary quite significantly in the extent to which they manage to mobilize or build upon the support from the lower socioeconomic sectors of society. Often, or in certain, and there are definitely cases, the election of Trump in the U.S. is one example, Bolsonaro in Brazil is another, where far-right movements come to power successfully and build significant support among middle and upper middle class populations rather than uh, the poorest. Um, in Germany, the alternative for Germany party, which has been really the uh, the greatest success right, um, in the German electoral system since the war um, has largely mobilized, has largely enjoyed the support of uh, the unemployed and the low paid uh, sectors, more, more so proportionally than other sectors of society. And that brings me to a question about one of the what what seems to be one of the unique factors or a number of unique factors in the German case. And I, I looked at sort of what, what you described, or at least in my analysis, as three different ruptures. We're talking about a binary between the past of the Third Reich and World War II and the new Germany uh, before and after the fall of communism. And of course, that overlaps with the reunification of East and West Germany. One of the most interesting chasms I, or, or uh, uh, difficulties seemed to be your description of how the reunification, in a way, left so many of the East Germans adrift. Their diplomas weren't recognized. And even if it was the generation of the parents of the people that you were studying, that had an impact on their lives. Um, how do these unique factors shape the manifestation of right-wing extremism in Germany today? Right. So the reunification um, had a, a very important uh, impact on the far right in Germany, and I would say more broadly across Europe, the fall of the Iron Curtain. Um, and it's... Uh, it's provoked several very critical far right in Europe has become much more socialist. It was far more economically conservative in the 80s, um, right wing um, economically in the 80s. And that's a clear impact of the uh, incorporation of, uh, of, of um, a large population that previously, previously lived under socialist regimes. And even if that population didn't identify with these regimes in particular, uh, they still held certain uh, aspirations and certain investments in the promises of a strong welfare state um, and uh, of socialism. So that that was a major change, uh, as was uh, the age, the fact that they've become younger. In Germany, it changed uh, the reunification changed uh, the the terms of various debates because before that, debates were often largely about the fate of Germany. All of a sudden, Germany was reunified. So now the question is, what happens next with this nation? Um, so reunification marked, I wouldn't say it started there. A lot of the processes that we witness today already um, um, appeared with the recessions of the, of the 1970s um, and with uh, the onset of uh, neoliberal politics in the early 80s, but uh, certainly uh, went through important transformations. The memory culture that we see in Germany today and the relation with right-wing extremism bear the stamp of reunification. And one of the major impacts was the appearance quite immediately during reunification of certain forms of violence that were not common before. So that people who aren't white, even though even in the GDR, um, they report to have suffered discrimination and racism, um, all of a sudden became victims of violent assaults, which is not something that they remember previously. 
And so that changed uh, qualitatively the nature of uh, the of right wing extremism in Germany, and uh, and 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 resulted in in a number of uh, arson attacks, pogroms, uh, lethal physical assaults since since the early nineties and until today. To what, to what extent was it um, a cultural clash as well as perhaps socioeconomic or, or political between uh, the disaffected people of, of the East and the German state? Because of going back to what you said about the culture of memory in Germany, this was mainly a Western, West German uh, uh, thing that you know evolved over the years and something that had to be entertained and maintained constantly. And uh, to what extent is the clash, the, the 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 sort of encounter, this abrupt encounter after unific- reunification, caused this adverse effect of uh, right wing extremism? Well, I think definitely one can speak about very different um, ideological orientations and ideological common senses, because uh, that, because what I mean by that is that they're shared often, even by people who think of themselves as um, standing in opposition to the regime under which they live in East Germany or in West Germany. Um, And these are are evident in stories that people tell of the time and of their first incursions, for example, into West Germany, if they're Easterners, or into East Germany, if they're Westerners, and the sense of uncanniness that they felt on these incursions. Um, One of my... Uh, collaborators told me of a nightmare in which they wake up in West Berlin lost. Um, um, he was from the East. So that there were, there were definitely, it was definitely an encounter between, between different um, societies. Yet the myth was that they're actually the same, that they're all Germans. So that there, there was really very little uh, way of approaching these differences um, except as historical relics. That is, except as describing the East as a historical relic of an authoritative, totalitarian culture. This, of course, didn't sit well with the Easterners who viewed themselves throughout history as the real anti-fascists and who, throughout their uh, socialization, um, have been recruited actively by state apparatuses to become to be, to understand themselves as anti-fascists, which was not necessarily the case in West Germany. The anti-fascists were rather um, radical groups, more marginal groups. And so um, that had a lot to do with the sense that Eastern Germans had and still have um, that they've been um, unfairly um, construed as these um, potential Nazis, Um, whereas, in fact, one could make the argument, as some Germans make it, that indeed they were the only Germans in history who staged a democratic revolution successfully, because the West Germans, let us recall, did not revolt either against the um, occupying powers or against... um, Germans against Nazis at the time, and the East Germans uh, succeeded in bringing down peacefully uh, a a totalitarian regime. So one finds among East Germans a lot of pride in that democratic spirit and a lot of resentment at the lack of appreciation for it. Well, that's fascinating. And I really I think that's an interesting segue to one of the main themes of your book, which is how the state we started to touch on it earlier, which is how the state does constrain some of those celebrated democratic freedoms, particularly freedom of expression, in order to constrain the kinds of political opinions that might later threaten democracy, which creates a really, you know, the paradox at the heart of your book. Um, Can you explain for, you know, in some in, in a little more detail what the state does that might be considered undemocratic in some other societies in order to in order to try to limit the influence of threats to democracy. Right. So the German state has a basic paradox at its founding, which is uh, the commandment never again. 
that is never again to allow something like Nazism to take power in Germany. One way to do that is by what's called militant democracy, that is guaranteeing in the Constitution all the basic liberties and freedoms that were violated by the Nazis. Another way to do it is to um, consolidate and reinforce repressive mechanisms that would keep watch over uh, development, anti-democratic developments, secret police, courts, laws, etc. Germany does both, and that's the paradox, because the, both of them are in tension with another. Um, and so, and so uh, the way that that's achieved in Germany, despite a constitutional prohibition on any form of censorship, um, is interesting because it reveals that these uh, freedoms, these liberal freedoms, are always limited, and they always have qualifications um, in liberal democratic states. So their absoluteness is never really uh, a reality. It's more of a myth. In Germany, the way it's done is through three main mechanisms. One has uh, to do with the prohibition of organizations, unconstitutional or anti-constitutional organizations. So, for example, the NSDAP, the Nazi Party, is an anti-constitutional organization and as such is banned in Germany. What that means is that any symbol or expression, verbal expression, associated with that party is also banned because it's viewed as uh, not as a communicative acts is somehow communicating that symbol, but as what we anthropologists like to call a performative act, it does something. In other words, what those symbols do is recruit supporters for the Nazi party. They are propaganda and as such they're banned. And that, that's why, or that's the way in which, for example, the swastika is banned or the expression Heil Hitler is banned in Germany. Um, so that's one. The other, another important set of laws has to do with what's called in Germany the protection of youth, and that protects youth of um, media that, that could be harmful um, to youth. And there's a lot of uh, neo-Nazi media that's on blacklists in Germany and therefore can't be legally um, commercialized. Um, and another set of laws refers to the denigration of the respect of the dead, of the victims of uh, Nazism, um, of uh, groups of people, ethnicities. That's where hate speech would come in, or the prohibitions on hate speech. Um, Holocaust denial comes in uh, under these laws. So it's a range of mechanisms that allow the German state to control what can and cannot be said and what the consequences would be for saying something, for uh, doing the Hitler salute in a particular situation. I was curious if we have, uh, if you can give us some examples of how this, uh, these, of how these constraints and laws affected the people that you were studying. Um, right. Were people sure. punishment and punished and arrested and well, not in that order, obviously. Right. Yeah. So if people were regularly um, taken to court for violations of these laws. Usually, it's what's called propaganda crimes. That means using symbols, etc that are not allowed. And uh, mostly, the, uh, most of the people I worked with were confused about these laws. They didn't quite understand them. A lot of these laws apply only in public, which means that they thought that they could do whatever they wanted in their private apartments. That wasn't necessarily true because a private apartment can become a public space, for example, if you have a party there. Um, and, uh, and so, they often got in themselves into trouble doing things that they didn't think were illegal, and often there were ambiguities in the laws themselves because judges had to determine whether a symbol that was tattooed on their arm or that decorated a jewelry piece that they wore was actually similar enough or not to a prohibited Nazi symbol um, to be identified as such. So there were many ambiguities that were often resolved in courts, overturned in courts, resolved differently at different state courts uh, across the, the Federal Republic. Um, and, and so for my uh, collaborators in the field, that entire legal field seemed like a, a very nebulous, um, ambiguous body of prohibitions. Yeah, well, while we're on that, I'd like to spend more time in telling us how you actually 
carried out your research? Because so far you've been talking, it was all very interesting, but it sounded as if you're a, a pundit or a journalist or a political scientist, someone who's looking at all these phenomena from above. And you actually observe these phenomena from the very bottom by, as you said, associating with those people. And of course it opens up all sorts of uh, dangers and as well as possibilities. You being a Jewish Israeli, a foreigner, you know, someone coming from the outside to look at them. Uh, you know, uh, you did mention earlier that many of them are extremely paranoid, often for good reason. Can you describe briefly how you entered the, the field before you actually started working in it? Yeah, that, that was the main challenge. And it was definitely a point that I thought my project was not going to succeed because of this, uh, this challenge. I found a team of street social workers, social workers who go on, walk on the street and serve marginalized populations that focused in particular on working with right-wing extremists, neo-Nazi groups that gathered on the streets in a Berlin district where that problem was especially um, high especially concerning. And they agreed to collaborate with me in the research and to let me embed myself myself with them in order to uh, get to know the clients they serve better. As a condition, they asked me to present myself as an American anthropologist from Chicago. At the time, I was uh, indeed a grad student at the University of Chicago. And uh, to go by the name of Nate rather than Nitsan. They feared that some of the more extreme figures in the local uh, right-wing extremist uh, scene uh, might uh, turn violent. And so I spent my time in the field as an American anthropologist named Nitsan, and by accompanying these street social workers and getting really to the, the places where these groups spent their days, many of them again were unemployed, um, or still officially in school, but not attending school, um, I came to know them and gradually develop personal relationships with their members and began to spend more and more time with them independently, whether in their apartments or in the park or in a, a train station kiosk or uh, going to soccer game in the soccer stadium of their local team, um, wh wherever it is that they hung out. And the, the research really based on the ethnographic materials and the stories and the anecdotes and the conversations that I had with these young people in, in, in their natural life, in their quotidian everyday existence. And from your experience observing them so closely, do you feel the kinds of constraints as, as implemented by the government with all the ambiguity and the legal challenges and the occasional arrests, do you think those are effective from what you could see? You described the confusion of some of these people. Does it work to constrain them uh, or does it create resentment and backlash and make them dig in? Right. Well, I think, I think unfortunately, again, the answer must be both. Um, for me, it was certainly, it made everything much more complicated as a researcher. Um, and uh, there was a lot of secrecy to be maintained and image to be managed. Uh, for them, uh, I would say, so for example, a, a not uncommon uh, trajectory is for a young, violent, neo-Nazi couple to get married, have a family, and then at some point... Um, the uh, the woman, the wife, who, and we've seen it in a number of cases, put an ultimatum to her husband to stop hanging out with these people anymore because every once in a while the husband would spend a period in prison and leave her alone um, with the baby or with babies or leave the home. And often that brings an end to the activism of these, of these enthusiasts. It's a life... Uh, sort of trajectory sort of development, uh, but it's 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 sort of encouraged by the repressive policies, right? Um, so that that's one thing. Another thing is another uh, place where that can be observed is in all the debates that these people have whenever there is a demonstration or any political action, and many of them indeed. Uh, don't participate, and they don't participate because they're afraid of legal consequences. They're afraid of getting into trouble with the police. A lot of them are on probation or have previous convictions. 
So to some extent, one could say that these uh, policies have um, certain effects that uh, help um, keep under control, at least, some of these currents. But there's no doubt that they also create a certain mystique and a certain aura for these, uh, uh, for these groups uh, that can be attractive, especially for adolescents, as, far as, as soon as uh, media is banned, songs are banned, bands are banned, uh, books are banned, um, they, they accrue a particular sort of value that then makes them more attractive as well. Nitana, I'd like to go back to you, to your experience, uh, specifically yes. as, a, as an ethnographer. Um, and, you know, dealing constantly with this threat, this potential threat of violence, of having your cover blown. I mean, there is a certain, you know, uneasiness accompanied to the whole thing. Do, do you think that it, in a way, benefited your inquiry or, or was detrimental to it or it didn't change anything at all? Yes, I think it, it definitely shaped the inquiry. Um, there have been some in anthropology who suggested that that sort of relationship can be detrimental. I don't find that to be the case. I think that um, the sort of intimacy that I managed to reach with my collaborators um, was as uh, solid as in other um, ethnographic um, ethnographic uh, uh, research projects and, and, and ethnographic books that I've seen, um, but it certainly shaped it in certain ways in terms of, for example, certain activities that I prefer to avoid for fear that participation in them would expose me. Um, and then many things that that um, that that I could do freely with my collaborators. There are certain ways, besides these particular limitations, for example, not crossing borders with them was an issue, so as not to be checked randomly uh, for my passport. There is another issue, though, where um, being having this identity set me up as an American there, which for most of them was a sort of a neutral. Uh, identification for some of them highly romanticized because of Hollywood and the cultural sort of industry, the American culture industry. For many of them, it was an antagonistic figure of the enemy, the arch enemy of the right. So that was a complicated situation, but a very productive one to be in. And it also allowed me, as a, as is the case, often the case for anthropologists working far from home, to um, to listen and uh, to be told things that often wouldn't be told to, uh, to natives, to people of the same culture, of the same society. So often people confide in the stranger, the person who's here today and gone tomorrow, as, as a famous sociologist one, once put it, uh, much more than they would in close, intimate neighbors, friends, and so on. So in that sense... Um, my otherness in the field was also very helpful, I think, especially on such tabooed themes as, uh, as sympathies to nationalism and to national socialism in Germany. Um, I suspect that if I were a German uh, PhD student, I, I might have had a harder time um, getting the sort of data that I was able to get. You know, I wonder uh, if we are worried that these trends might be encroaching more and more on the mainstream. I wonder if you can identify any factors in place in Germany today that makes this different from the Nazi era and, and World War II and the Third Reich. Are there aspects of German society and law that you think will ensure, with all the difficulties that entails, that these ideologies do not become more prominent in the mainstream? I think that uh, at, at present, uh, I, I'm not very concerned about German democracy. I think it's a very solid democracy, and there have been historical processes that have established some some very uh, strong um, norms of uh, a liberal democratic order. I, I personally don't see that in danger um, currently. 
There are other developments, though, and in Germany they're very evident, which have to do with the modernization of the extreme right. So even when I was doing research for my book, the extreme right in Germany was far behind other European countries in terms of modernization. It was very traditionalist. It was still an extreme right that was very much about blood. It was not an extreme right that integrated people that it didn't consider ethnically German. It was a homophobic extreme right. It was uh, an extreme right that was uh, uh, very traditional as far as gender roles were concerned ideologically. That's not the case today anymore. The Alternative for Germany Party has learned from other European experiences and has modernized itself, as other parties have done uh, throughout Europe, um, to, for example, incorporate Jews among its ranks. There is a Jewish group in the AfD to incorporate gay people among its ranks. There is a gay people, a great a gay group in the AfD. And one of the leaders of the party uh, is uh, a lesbian who lives with a wife, uh, who's an immigrant, and they have children. That's a much more modern form of nationalism and xenophobia that today uh, addresses far broader audiences. So that's a concerning development. Again, one that in other countries in Europe has happened uh, decades ago. Dr. Nitan Shoshan, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you so much. My and pleasure. also big thanks to Itai Shalem, our sound engineer, and again to the uh, Israel office of the Conrad Adenauer Foundation for the partnership in this series. Now we've got a request. Many or most of you listen to us on the Apple Podcast app and would like to ask you to please consider writing us a review. All you have to do is go into iTunes and rate us in the ratings and review section. You too can support us by going to our website and subscribing onto our a Patreon campaign. Check out our archive. It has about 600 interviews. And if you like what we do here, you can also like us on Facebook. Our page is called the Tel Aviv Review Podcast Ideas from Israel. And last but not least, do not forget to follow me and Dahlia on Twitter. Join us again next week for another edition of the Tel Aviv Review. And until then, from Dahlia and from me, goodbye. Goodbye.